Louise Hay. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, it's been um, a fantastic, wide-ranging debate with um, truly excellent contributions um, from both sides of the House, uh, demonstrating, I think, the complexity of the um, factors and the causes behind serious violence and the, um, the genuine crisis that is enveloping communities across the country. We heard from the Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North about the excellent um, public health model that is being championed in Scotland and that has been, is being learnt from across England and Wales, and particularly the policy implications for treating violence as a disease. Um, we heard from the, um, my honourable friend, the member for Lewisham Deptford, who was quoted many times, a true champion of um, the causes and the policy requirements from youth violence, and the chair of the Youth Violence Commission. She gave an incredibly powerful speech about the repeat patterns of characteristics of adverse childhood experiences and she gave uh, two sort of sliding doors scenarios of a young man growing up uh, in a vulnerable situation not able to get the help he needs compared to a young man with similar vulnerab uh, vulnerabilities who is able to access support structures and systems um, under an active interventionist caring approach that will prevent him falling into violence or becoming a victim of violence himself. It's very similar to a young man that was in my own constituency, actually, who I was desperately trying to get um, help for. And sadly, unlike John, who he described, he didn't, um, he, his life was similarly lost but at the hands of another child, and his, um, and his experience was very similar to that described by my honourable friend. The chair of the um, Home Affairs Select Committee spoke about her inquiry, her committee's inquiry into serious violence, crucially taking the voices of young people who talk about the fact that they don't have a trusted police officer, they don't have one uh, attached to their school, they don't have any local models of neighbourhood policing that they can um, respond to and, um, and get to know. And she spoke about the need for the scale and pace of government action to match the scale and pace of violence that we are seeing in this country. And, and the fact is, and we've heard from many speakers, that that urgency is simply not being felt from this government in response to the violence that is um, enveloping our, uh, the, uh, the country. She, um, she gave examples of evidence that was given to her committee, um, quotes from senior police officers who said that the government was more interested in narrative than action, and from Louise Casey, who described the government's strategy as woefully inadequate. Uh, the honourable members um, from Stafford and Bexhill and Battle drew on their own personal experience in youth service and the need for education and prevention, and that's been a reassuring theme of today's debate, the real focus on the need for early intervention and prevention. And I think there is cross-party uh, agreements that that is absolutely essential um, in addition to a strong criminal justice um, uh, response. And of course, as part of that, there's been a huge amount of focus on the cuts to youth services. My honourable friend uh, for Bethnal Green and Bow particularly spoke about the cuts in her own constituency, the increasing number of children in care, increasing numbers of um, exclusions, and the fact that Although we have previously seen, under previous governments, of course, spikes in youth violence, it hasn't been this way that we have such a vulnerable cohort of young people at risk of falling into violence um, and a sustained year-on-year -year trend now of growth in serious violence. My honourable friend uh, from Newport East, spoke about the excellent work being done in Gwent Police Force, and I think it is important to acknowledge the excellent initiatives that are taking place um, in some police forces. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Welsh Government on their one public service approach, their focus on adverse childhood experiences, and their commitment to developing trauma-informed public services. But she made the point, as all others have done, that resources are required to make that partnership working um, effective. Uh, my honourable friend for Gedling gave his usual impassioned speech on this subject and called on the Home Secretary. It's great that he's here today, but to come to the House more often to update us on the work that he's doing, on the progress his government is making, to convene COBRA um, and to show us the urgency that this house, that this place today is so clearly demanding. 2,000 county lines, 10,000 children involved. Um, the, as we say, the, the urgency that that clearly presents is simply not being felt by the government. Um, now, the Honourable Member for Solihull talked about 700 uh, young victims of knife crime last year in the West Midlands, and he talked about the £106 million, I think he said, 
that he believes West Midlands Police Force um, is currently sitting on in terms of re reserves. I believe he knows that that figure is from 2017 and that the figure is in fact £43 million of available reserves, um, which are intended to fall to £30 million next year, simply to balance the books. And in fact, his Police and Crime Commissioner intends to use all non-essential non reserves by 2020-21. Should understand that. That is the point at which the Police and Crime Commission made the decision to close Solio Police Station. At that point, it's sitting on 106 million in reserves. But at that point, the Police and Crime, Crime Commissioner already had a plan to use all available reserves purely to balance the books because of continued central government cuts since 2010. And I would ask the Honourable Member, would he rather see frontline officers on the beat um, responding to violent crime or um, police stations open? And though that's the invidious position that Police and Crime Commissioners across this country have been put in by um, sustained central government cuts. The Honourable Member for Moray um, said he was disappointed that we voted against the police funding settlement early this year. I'm sorry um, to have disappointed him, and my, my right honourable friend did promise him that I would um, explain why the precept is such a fundamentally unfair way to fund police forces. The fact of the matter is that West Yorkshire has doubled the population of Surrey and four times levels of violent crime. Yet through this government's police funding settlement, they are able to raise exactly the same amount through the precept. In the same police funding settlement, South Yorkshire raises 12% of the money lost since 2010, compared to Dorset that can raise 32% of the money it's lost since 2010. It is unjustifiable to raise money through this way that bears no bearing at all to levels of crime or the demand on the police. Honourable Lady, for giving way, and just to be absolutely clear, because I wouldn't like someone to read the start of Hansard and then wonder what happened at the end of Hansard. It wasn't me that made that point. I think she was referring to someone on the front bench. It was absolutely not the point I was making, because we don't have PCCs in Scotland. I, I think he might have misheard me. I didn't say anything about PCCs. He mentioned earlier that he was disappointed why we voted against him. I'm say, explaining exactly why we did, because it's a fundamentally unfair way to fund the police and has absolutely no bearing. Um, on demand. Uh, but the Honourable uh, Lady for Enfield North talked, um, uh, uh, built on her admirable campaigning work um, on county lines and talked about, as my Honourable Friend for Gedling did, the excellent work that community groups do in all our constituencies, um, but how they are scraping by year to year and competing for confusing and small pops, pots of money. Uh, the Honourable Lady for Brentford and Isleworth sadly um, spoke about the tragic deaths of teenagers in her constituency and the fact that the police are working with one hand um, at least behind their back, le um, lurching from one hotspot to the other, which is not as effective as it could be with sustained neighbourhood policing models in place. My honourable, member, uh, my honourable friend for Elmsmere, Port and Nesden, um, built on the valuable experience of speaking to frontline officers in his constituency and spoke about how they told him they are able to predict children very, at a very, very young age of becoming involved in gangs, and he rightly said that this was a failure of the criminal justice system and, indeed, society. And he, he touched on domestic abuse, which um, actually has been uh, missing from this debate today. But um, when, when I meet young offenders, when I visit youth offenders' institutes, one of the most consistent factors in their backgrounds is from a, a household of domestic abuse. So we welcome the domestic abuse bill uh, when it eventually comes, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, all those MPs that have signed my letter today calling on uh, for an investigation into domestic abuse in the family courts. If we continue to allow children to grow up in households of domestic abuse, all we are doing is creating the next generation of young offenders. Um, and and finally, my honourable friend for Lewisham East gave a powerful perspective, uh, speaking on behalf of communities that are overpoliced and the consequences for those communities um, in failing to build trust and relationships with the police. She also spoke about looked after children and care leavers who are overrepresented in our criminal justice system, showing the breadth of policy areas and focus that the public health approach undeniably has to focus on. Madam Deputy Speaker, last month's crime statistics re reveal the extent of the crisis before us today. As we have heard, never since record began has recorded violent crime been as high as it is today. Yet police numbers stand at the lowest level for three decades, per population the lowest level ever. And it is important to reiterate why, it, why numbers of police are important in tackling violent crime. 
First of all, the fall in police officer numbers inevitably forces the police to refocus their resources on reactive policing. But more crucially, local policing increases the legitimacy of police, which encourages the local community to provide intelligence, report crimes and work with the police proactively. And that has been a massive failure of the last nine years of austerity, that cut to neighbourhood policing, which has damaged, damaged relations so seriously in community. Now, policing matters, of course it does, but as we've heard, the government can only hope to bear down on serious violence if they bear down on the factors that lie behind serious violence and their role in them. The story of violence, and particularly youth violence, is at its heart a question of vulnerability. Children who fall behind and are denied the speech and language therapy they desperately need. Sure Start, a lifeline for many vulnerable parents, cut back and the support it used to provide reduced. As children grow older, they are being routinely denied the talking therapies, cognitive behavioural therapies and other psychological support which we know can reduce aggression and delinquency. Schools crushed under the weight of punitive funding pressures have focused their cost-cutting on exactly the kind of targeted support which young people falling behind need, teaching assistance and special educational needs. Families denied intensive therapies which improve parenting schools, strengthen family cohesion, increase young people's engagement and are known to reduce out of home placements and reoffending. Now, ministers come to this dispatch box and they regrettably insist that this is a problem that has appeared from nowhere. We have never heard any minister accept that a reduction in support services, a substantial cut in youth services, and slashing the police back to levels per head never seen before has made the blindest bit of difference. If they cannot accept their responsibility, then how can we trust them to put things right? So allow me to come to their efforts on early intervention and prevention. What is replacing the £880 million worth of complex provision and support for young people? What is replacing the £500 million lost from Sure Start? An early intervention fund at £17 million a year, a youth endowment fund at £20 million a year. Each of these have been shown to be inadequate in their own way and not even close to the challenges faced by communities. 73% of bids to the Early Intervention Fund have been rejected by the government. Communities in the West Midlands have been deprived of vital projects to tackle county lines exploitation. In Greater Manchester, they have been deprived of funding to support families against crime. In Durham and across the country, it is the same story where violent crime hotspots are occurring. How can the government look at this evidence and say their efforts to tackle this problem are even close to matching the challenge? So finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to turn to the public health model. As we've heard, the government have launched a consultation on new legal duty to underpin a public health approach to tackling serious violence. But it is far from clear how this will differ or go beyond duties already placed on agencies under crime and disorder partnerships or under working together guidance. A true public health approach requires a resourced, coordinated strategy across governments led by the Prime Minister, as we have repeatedly called for. The task force mentioned by the Home Secretary today, chaired by her, has met once and so far no actions have been announced. We are in a state of emergency where the most despicable criminals are exploiting the space where well-run and effective early intervention, prevention and diversion strategies once existed. The pursuit of young children by gangs is now a systematic and well-rehearsed business model, according to the Children's Commissioner. It is a national crisis that demands a sense of urgency which is not being felt from this government. We cannot allow this drift. We need ministers to step up to the plate. We need leadership from the Prime Minister. We need resources and we need concerted, sustained action from this government. Yeah. Yeah.